As I begin preparing for this week and praying, and I so appreciate the Lord so much all the time. But I so enjoy, I not only appreciate, I enjoy the Lord early, early in the morning as I'm driving to work. That's right. I was thinking the other day as my age begins to creep up on me and the years begin to count off that in a few years, I won't be making that drive probably to South Carolina. But Only the Lord that. knows. You never know. Amen. But, you know, he has so blessed me during those times of that two-and-a-half-hour drive, of, especially of the morning and the afternoon, to talk to him, to hear from him, to listen to other preachers and their word through him. And it's just it just blesses my soul. And as I was driving down this week, and it was raining every day, as I hit 26, especially the other morning when it was raining so hard and all the construction, I began to pray and thank the Lord for giving me safety just to get through that stretch of the interstate. But then as I started down the mountain and looking along, I was seeing where people were beginning to have plowed up and they were tending their gardens and gardens were growing. And the Lord gave me the thought this morning for ruining the garden. Ruining the garden. And I'm going to be speaking this morning from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and also from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. But to begin this morning, I found this story, and I thought for the sermon it was a very good illustration. There was a young man, and he said when he was young, his family would plant an annual garden. And they started on Labor Day and cared for it all summer long. That's what he said, but I think he meant at the beginning of the year. One of the jobs, though, was essential to having a good garden was weeding the garden. And I thought, he said, I thought that pulling the weeds was kind of fun because as a little boy, you got to tear stuff up. And I got the task with enthusiasm because I was going to get to go through the garden jerking up the weeds. And he said, I would rip those weeds out with an absolute vengeance. And he said, I would talk to him as I went and say, you weeds, you be sorry you'd be a part of our garden. And then he said, I will never forget one of those times he was allowed to help pull weeds. And his cousin thought it would be funny to show him the quote, unquote, right weeds to pull. And he said, unfortunately for me, when, they sh when he showed me uh, what was a weed was not actually a weed, but it was the plant that had been planted. He was pulling a prank on me. So he said, I went down the road and I pulled out the row and pulled out virtually every single one of the plants. And he said, before I knew what was happening, my uncle was yelling and trying to get me to stop. He said, I was told that I was ruining the garden. And at the end of the day, I was no longer pulling weeds, period. And my cousin was replanting all of the quote unquote weeds that he had told me to pull. He said, why did I ruin the garden that day? He said, I was tricked into doing it. I was told to lie, and I believed it. Now, if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, you remember those words. I was told to lie, and I believed it. I did something totally stupid, he said, just because I believed what I was told. He said, I wish I could say that that was the only time that I was deceived into doing something dumb. But you know, if, you, if we are real honest with ourselves, we've all done things before. And you know, there's so many ways that we get tricked if we do not keep our Christian walk with the Lord totally in check. In other words, we have to keep the weeds out of our garden, our spiritual garden of our lives, so it doesn't ruin the garden that God is expecting you and I to grow. We should never trade truth for a lie. You know, I don't care if a lie or an untruth makes you popular. It advances your stature or your rank with a company or whatever to bring you pleasure. We have to, as Christians, stay true to keeping our spiritual garden clean so that the fruit and the plants can grow and not be smothered out. Amen. We have to not believe the lies and commit the misconceptions of the devil. 
Because let me tell you something. The devil will throw things in your path to make you think that this is okay. This is okay. And it's not. It will, the devil will stir our lives in the wrong direction if he possibly can. And he will cause us not to prosper the way God wants us to. You know, my dad down here, I, I mention him a lot, but that garden reminds me of that. Now, there's one thing dad did, boy. He didn't believe in letting weeds grow in his garden. He didn't believe in letting things get out of hand down there. If it meant him down there in the heat of the day when he shouldn't have been, he was down there planting. He was down there weeding. And dad always grew a beautiful garden with multiple, multiple um, bushels of crop more than he and mom ever needed and more than us kids even needed when they passed it on. They would give it away. But anyway, the Old Testament tells us of another lie that ruined a different garden. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou therefore eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now God had created Adam, and he placed him in the garden of Eden. Eden was a place, of, I know, of spectacular beauty, and it is considered to be the best place in the entire earth. Eden would be as close to a paradise, I think, as anyone could get. And Adam was placed there in the ideal setting for two distinct reasons. The first was to work the garden. This means that Adam was to make the garden his home, to beautify it, to take care of it. And that was the second thing. The New King James in this phrase, to keep, the Hebrew word actually means to guard or to protect. Why would Adam need to protect the garden? Well, verse 17 gives us our answers. God, Adam was to protect the garden so that no one touched the tree of knowledge. This was the only tree in the entire garden that was restricted from Adam. In fact, it was the only thing that was off limits to Adam. God provided everything that Adam would ever need and gave only one condition for the garden. And he also clearly told Adam what would happen if he disobeyed. Now I'm getting to a point with what God told Adam that relates to us today. He told Adam, if you partake of that, you will surely die. Now this is a strong language, but it is exactly what God is saying here. You cannot die more than once. And spiritually speaking, when Adam partaken of that thing, he said he would surely die. There are two different types of deaths that Adam would experience at that time. There would be a spiritual death, and then there would be a physical death later. And God is clear about what he says. And this gives you and I an example today that we need to understand. Number one, we should never trade God's truth for a lie. Right. Adam knew what God's truth was, and he knew what God told him. Now the serpent, who was crafty, more than any of the, all the wild life, animals of the, of the Lord that God had made, he said to the woman, did God really say, I can just hear it, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? This is in Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Let me just read it to you rather than just give you my version of it. It said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, <coughs> Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruits of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Doesn't that sound like the devil? He's already telling her. He's already trying to conflict God. Tell her a lie. 
Number five, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. <coughs> and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired, listen to those words, folks. Let me read them again. That when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and did gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. <coughs> God had already told Adam clearly what was going to happen if he disobeyed. And that servant was crafty. And see, the servant entered the garden telling Eve that she wouldn't die if she eat the fruit. He lied to him right off the bat. Who should have they been believing? They should have been believing what God told them, not what Satan told them. Right. You and I, in our lives today, we have a spiritual garden that God has given us for you and I to tend to. It's up to us to keep the weeds out of our spiritual garden. We need to stay away from the things that are going to make that's going to smother out the fruit that God wants us to bear. And from the start, there are two key problems here. The first is that he, first of all, even listened to the devil or to the servant. Adam had been given dominion over all the creation, and that included the servant. He was a part of that creation. And Eve was literally surrounded the authority of the position that God had given to her when she listened to the servant who actually had a lower place than she did. What happens to us today? Sometimes we get so involved in what we want to be good and what we want to accomplish that we listen to the servant. We listen to the devil and it brings weeds into our spiritual garden. Amen. And how many times do we do that? Sometimes we drop so far below the level that God intends for us to have because we trade our place spiritually for something cheap. Right. The second is that Eve doesn't communicate God's truth appropriately. Now think about that. When she refutes the statement, does she give what God told Adam? No. She adds another aspect to the statement. Eve says that the tree could not be touched. Did God ever tell Adam that? No. He told him not to eat of it. Who's at fault here? Who's at fault? Adam was given the instruction by God and passed them to Eve. It was Adam's responsibility to communicate God's truth to Eve, and I believe in that respect he may have failed. But the major failure is not what they, what who said who to what, but it's what they did going against what God told them. And by that, Eve allowed the servant to trick her into eating the fruit. When you and I partake of things that we know is not what God wants us to have in our spiritual garden, we are lowering ourselves to allow the devil to trick us. Because let me tell you something. You may think that you're good. And you may think that you're strong. But you go against God's will for your life. You let the weeds start growing in your garden. And you will find out real quick it's going to smother out the plants. That's right. When a garden gets full of weeds, do you know what happens? The first thing it does is a lot of times it will actually smother out the plants till they won't even grow. They will die. And if you think for one morning, that one minute that you or I can allow weeds to grow in our spiritual garden, the weeds of this world, <coughs> the things of this world, and all the things that are wrong, if we allow them to grow in our spiritual garden, it will smother our spiritual relationship. The things, you know, the Bible tells us to produce. Spiritually speaking, God wants us to grow. He wants us to produce other fruit. And if we allow the weeds to grow in our garden, it is going to hinder us from being able to produce the fruit that we need to fruit, that we need to produce, and that we need to grow in our garden. And even if it doesn't kill the plant, a lot of times, a lot of weeds will smother the plants 
to what little fruit it bears are not very good fruit. Amen. I can remember in the garden, one year we had lots of rain. And the rice just kept going and kept growing. And the potato, I mean the tomatoes took a blight. Some of the potatoes rotted in the ground. Why? Because they were afflicted by what was going on in the garden besides the production. The servant tricked Eve in eating this fruit. And what happened when she eat the fruit? She thought nothing happened. But immediately there was a change, wasn't there? Amen. Adam saw it and God saw it. See, their eyes were not opened until they ate of the fruit. And when they did, the truth is that Adam knew that they had done wrong. Our relationship, folks, with God is measured by our heart. And if we're obedient because of what we are supposed to do, then God will bless us. But if we are not and we think we can hide it, I got news for you. We can't hide anything from God. The three questions that God asked them when this happened. Both of their eyes were opened. And up until this point, they didn't pay any attention to the fact that they were naked, did they? Read the Bible. It's in there. But when they ate of the fruit, it says they realized they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves and made coverings for themselves. And then when they heard the Lord coming in the cool of the day, and you can read this, you can find it in Genesis 2, 7 through 9, when they heard the Lord coming in the cool of the day, they hid from him. They'd never hid from him before. And they hid from God. Why? Because they knew they had done wrong. And when the Lord called to them, he said, Adam, Adam, where are you? What did Adam say? We're here. See, what did this show you, folks? It showed you the garden that God gave them to take care of. They allowed the devil to lie to them. The devil, folks, is nothing but a lie, a father of lies. And nothing that he says is true. You know, the devil can quote scripture. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. The Bible says a lot of times that you find a wolf in sheep's clothing. What does that mean? There are people out there who are deceptive. There are people out there who would lead you astray. There's people out there who will twist things and try to make you think a lie is the truth and it is not. Right. You know, Satan will use whatever means he makes to try to grow weeds in your garden and in my garden. Right. He'll use whoever, he'll use whatever, anything he can. But folks, we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. Either we're going to listen to the truth of God or to the lies of Satan. It's that simple. You and I have to make sure that our relationship is measured by the desires of our heart. If we are obedient, we are going to be obedient. And when the little weeds, and don't get me wrong, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But if we make a mistake, it's like there's a weed now growing in the garden. And when we make that mistake and God brings it to our attention, we need to be pulling it. We need to get down and ask God to forgive us, to ask God to help us and get that weed out of our spiritual garden so it does not hinder the growth of our spiritual garden and the fruit of it. A lot of times, people fall backward in their relationship because of the weeds that are smothering their spiritual garden. The things that they have allowed to grow in their spiritual lives and hinder what they were when the day. I've seen people that have gotten saved and man, they were on fire for God. They were ready to work for God. They were reading their Bible. They were doing all they could. And then down the road piece, you see them farther and farther away from exactly that. Why? A lot of times it's because they let the weeds grow in their spiritual garden. And they've made the choice to keep going that direction till it's drowning out what they need to have. Folks, 
God gave us these examples for a reason. God wants us to trust in him, to do what he has given us to do. And just like he told Adam and Eve to leave that alone, there's things all throughout this Bible that God has told us, do not do. There's things throughout this Bible that God has told us to do. And when we don't do them, we are allowing the weeds to grow in our garden. This is not in my notes, but I'm going to throw it in here because God just gave it. There's also such things of ruining the garden by not doing what God told you to do. That's growing a bad weed in your spiritual garden. When God tells you to do something with your talent, when God tells you to do something with your life, when God tells you to witness to somebody or invite somebody to church and you're like, mm, maybe I better not. Folks, that's the same. So it is as wrong and you can ruin your spiritual garden by not doing what God tells you to do as much as doing what's in this word it tells you not to do. It's a fine line. And the only way that you and I can grow a beautiful spiritual garden and not ruin it is following this word. Genesis 3.13, the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And what, did, what did Eve say to it? The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, what am I saying here? What goes on next? Adam and Eve immediately started, sh started shifting the blind game back and forth. Did oh. they not? Adam blamed God for giving Eve to him. Mm -hmm. Eve blames the servant for deceiving her. But the truth being is, when God asked a specific question here, he had a specific reason for it. What was it? God wanted Adam and Eve to take responsibility for what they had done. I thought about this often. What do you think would have happened if Eve and Adam had said, Oh God, we have done wrong. Please forgive us. Think about that. What do you think God would have done? I think I know what he would have done. But you know what? Anywhere that things are going on that we have weeds growing in our garden, we need to take responsibility for them is what he's telling us here. We need to get the weed out of our garden. Instead, we want to shift blame a lot of times. Even as Christians, Christians are guilty of this as much as a sinner person. They want to blame someone else for why they have weeds in their spiritual garden. But you know what? It's not your responsibility to keep the weeds out of my garden. It's my responsibility. Right. It's my responsibility to daily examine my life and see if I am walking the way God wants me to walk following his words, if I am talking and doing the things that God wants me to do according to his words. You know, it's time that the church, and in closing, this is how I really feel and I pray that, and this is what God gave me. It's time that Christians and each one of us individually take accountability and start producing and maintaining the spiritual garden that God expects us to. It's time for us to stop blaming other things. It's time. I hear people all the time. I hear this all the time. Well, this country we live in, this is the worst thing. This world is all, yeah, this world may be dying and going to hell in a handbasket, but guess what? I serve a God that is not. And Amen. this world is not going to end until God says it's done. Amen. It's done. And until then, he has given me the ability. He has given me his word. <coughs> he has given me the understanding to do what he's called me to do. And as long as I do that, my spiritual garden is going to keep growing. I'm going to keep producing the fruit that God wants me to, fruit, to do. But we need to get the weeds of this world, our own ambitions, well, other people's expectations, Things in our lives that God don't want us to have. Smothering his spirit from keeping us from growing for him. Just like the weeds in the garden smother out the plants and keep them from producing or kill them. He wants us to get our garden clean. He does not want us to ruin our spiritual garden right. by not keeping it clean. So I ask us the question today, and you noticed I said us. 
I ask us the question today. Is our gardens weeded? Do we fertilize it? How do you fertilize a spiritual garden, Donna? This word right here. And prayer on your knees. And talking to God daily. And asking for his wisdom and his side. And that's the fertilizer that's going to grow. And when you do, your spiritual garden is going to grow. And you're going to be productive for God. So in closing, I challenge you. Each one of you and myself. Let's examine and look at our own spiritual garden. Let's see where we are. And if there's things that's hindering us, we need to get rid of it, folks. That's right. <coughs> I don't care if I like it or it's fun. If it's hindering me from being what God wants me to be, I need to get rid of it. I need to pull that weed out. I need to throw it out of my spiritual garden. And I need to move forward with what God's called me to do. And if we'll do that, I will promise you this. Your fruit and your garden will produce what God intended it to do and produce. And the most important thing is in the end of time, when I close my eyes on earth and I open my eyes in heaven, if my garden has been producing like God called it to, and the fruit of, the, of him is what it's supposed to be, my Lord and Savior will say, well done, thy good and faith, the faithful servant. I have made you faithful over a little. Now come in and prosper much. Amen. Let me tell you, folks, there's nothing like having a good, clean, spiritual garden. Look at our lives. Examine yourself and ask yourself, do I have the spiritual garden? That, thank you, Lord. Do I have the spiritual garden that God wants to walk through? Amen. Amen. May God bless you.